Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel of Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. Listen now for the word of the Lord. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost, he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do your doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet. It is I myself. Touch and see me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet, and while they still don't believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witnesses to these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The word of God for the people of God. So last week we looked at a similar passage from the Gospel of John where Jesus appears to the disciples. However, the focus was more on doubting Thomas. Now Thomas gets a bad rap, right, for his speculation about what the others have been telling him about Jesus. And in his moment of questioning, something the others saw as a terrible moment in his life became a label that he would have to live with and defend for the rest of his However, being a doubter should not be a scarlet letter placed on anyone. We talked in our Easter study last week about how our doubts are there to strengthen our faith. Not listening or taking for face value what people or the media outlets tell us is should be commendable. We should all validate what we hear. Whether it's a sermon message or a news headline, we should be like the Bereans of Scripture who heard what Paul had to say but validated what was proclaimed against what Scripture had to say, because that is our final authority. Amen? But Thomas gets labeled. Doubting Thomas. Many of us can relate to Thomas, can't we? Many of us have done something in our past, made a stupid mistake that everybody calls us by or remembers us by. We get labeled by that event. People like to point out other people's failures because it deflects the attention off of their shortcomings and failures when they can point to someone else. That's how many people refer to someone by their mistakes. Maybe not directly to your face, right? They don't have that much courage. But that's how they talk to you and about you in private or maybe behind a keyboard. We get brave when we're behind a keyboard and we don't have to look at the person as we're typing out those comments. Thankfully, Jesus calls us by our name, not by our sin. Amen. So this week we're looking at this passage from Luke's gospel that parallels John's telling of Jesus' appearance to the disciples when Thomas was not there. We see in Luke's gospel that he chooses not to highlight Thomas' doubt, but Jesus' revelation. And the passage begins with, while they were talking about this, which raises two questions, who is they and what were they talking about, right? Now, before we can continue with this passage, you all know I like context. So we're going to look at some of the context of what was happening then and before this passage starts. Because if we just start right here, we would assume that it was the disciples, the ones that we're most familiar with, that were in the room, the 11 that were talking. But that is not who the they is that they're referring to. The previous passage is one of my favorites. It's the story of Jesus meeting the two men on the road to Emmaus. It was Sunday afternoon. Jesus had just resurrected that morning, and he had shown himself to Mary and the other women at the tomb. And now he shows himself to these two men who were dejected and returning home to Emmaus. Because they didn't believe what had happened either. I mean, if I thought that, if I believed Jesus had resurrected, I wouldn't be going home dejected. 
I'd be in Jerusalem trying to find him. Jesus suddenly appears to them on the road. Jesus is, Jesus is all over the place that Sunday, right? I guess if I had just resurrected, I'd have been all over the place too, showing myself off. But these two men experienced the risen Christ and their eyes were opened. It shows that many people can be in church. They can know the scriptures. They can know the stories. But if they haven't experienced the risen Christ, their eyes are still closed. And it says they immediately run and find the eleven. And verse 35 states, Then they told them what had happened on the road and how he had made them known to them by breaking of the bread. In other words, they were witnessing to the disciples what they had seen and heard, not to what they had been told and read. What they had seen and heard, what they had experienced. In our passage today, Jesus tells the disciples in verse 48, you are my witnesses. You are the witnesses to these things. And that's what I want to talk about today. The question I have for everyone here is, can I get a witness? Now, the ladies did a great job in segmenting this uh, message today. So today we've got five ingredients, so to speak, of how you can be a witness, what it takes to be a witness. Now, you've been talking to someone. Have you ever been talking about someone? If they mysteriously show up, it's kind of freaky, isn't it? Um, it can be kind of embarrassing depending on what you're talking about or what you're saying about that person. But that's what's going on here. These two disciples from the road to Emmaus were talking to the eleven and their companions, telling them all what had just happened to them. They're like, we're just walking along the road, paying our own attention to what, we're not paying attention to what's going on. I right, got our heads down, we're just talking about all the things that happened today, and this guy shows up. Out of nowhere, he just shows up, wants to know, what y'all talking about? And we're like, dude, haven't you heard? And then he calls us foolish. And then he starts taking us through the scriptures and saying how all these things were supposed to happen. It was so interesting that when he was saying that when we got to the house, we invited him to stay at our house because we wanted to hear more. People want to hear more about Jesus. So they sit down and they take the bread and he breaks it and you're not going to believe this it was jesus right there with us just like the women this morning we saw him too the first thing do we have to have or to be as a witness is present while the two disciples were telling this story jesus appears and says peace be with you now can you imagine that scene the two disciples are there, they're excited, they're all animated, they're telling their story, and Jesus appears. They don't see him. The disciples are like hitting each other. It's Jesus. Because had, they hadn't seen the risen Christ yet either. This was the first time that they had seen him. The women saw him earlier. The men were telling him about him, but they hadn't seen him. Scripture says they were startled and terrified. They were afraid. They were locked in a room because they were afraid of what might happen to them. The Roman authorities had crucified their teacher. They were being accused of stealing the body from the tomb. What's going to happen to them? They were afraid. And if we're all honest with ourselves, we all have fears for one time or another. We cannot escape our fear sometimes. For many people, the fear of hearing that dreaded C word, right? Now, normally that dreaded C word would be cancer. And for many of us, hearing that word still brings fear and anxiety upon us. But today, that C word is COVID. That's the word that's striking fear in most people today. But it's not just our health issues that we fear. Some of us may be fearing unemployment issues. I know many people here are retired, but there's those that are fearing unemployment because of COVID. Others may be fearing a failing marriage. For many of us, the one that we can't seem to really talk about a lot is that fear of death. Whether it's our own or it's someone we love, the fear of death plagues so many people. But Jesus showed up in the midst of all their fears. He knew that his presence would ease their fears. He says to them, peace be with you. And peace was with them because he was with them. 
So to be witnesses, we must be present in people's lives, and not just the lives of the people here in church, but people in all of our circles. See, we haven't, we haven't liked this quarantine life we've been living over the past year, but the truth is, we Christians, we've, we have a bad habit of living a quarantine life disguised as a Christian life. You know what I'm talking about? See, there are a lot of Christians who, once they find Jesus, only associate with other Christians. They feel like they have to stop hanging around with those people and going to those places they used to go to because they might be a bad influence on them, right? But is that what Jesus did? Did he only hang around with the righteous? No. In fact, the Pharisees continually accused him for hanging with sinners. Eating with sinners and tax collectors? Come on, man. What kind of rabbi are you? But what if instead of thinking they're going to be a bad influence on you, you saw the relationship as being a good influence on them? Think about it. Do we need to witness to other believers? You can. It helps to keep everybody's faith going. But it's hard to be the light when you stay in the light. You have to go into the darkness to be the light. Therefore, to be a witness, one must be present. And the next thing you have to be is vulnerable. Jesus says, look at my hands and my feet. Jesus shows the disciples his scars. Some of us wear scars that bear witness to the great skills of a certain surgeon in their life. I've got a good friend of mine who will happily show you his scar from his cancer surgery that turned out to be no cancer surgery at all. Because when they got in there, they couldn't find the tumor they went in to take out. Other scars bear witness to a life full of adventures. Life full of experiences that have taught us lessons. In some cases, they bring back memories. Some of those memories are happy. Others are quite painful. Who in here has seen the movie Jaws? Not the remake, but the original. There's a, there's a scene in that movie where the men are out on the boat, and they're out the, they've been chasing this shark around for days, and Quentin Hooper, well, they... They have a little too much to drink, so to speak. And they start comparing their scars. I don't know if you remember this scene or not. Each scar had a story. And each one tried to one-up the other with the scar and the next scar. Because we like to do that, right? Because your pain's not as bad as my pain. Your joy's not as bad as my joy. I've, we've always got to one-up. But once finished with the visible scars, Hooper starts to unbutton his shirt and he starts pointing to his chest, right? There's no scar there. And he says, Mary Ellen Moffat broke his heart. And they all laugh hysterically. And when they finish laughing, Sheriff Brody notices a scar on Quint, the boat captain's arm. Turns out the scars are from where he had had a tattoo removed. And after a couple of drunken guesses of what the tattoo and scar might have meant and they finished laughing Quint tells him Hooper that there was the USS Indianapolis and it just gets quiet nobody says a word you see for the, the normal movie goer that doesn't look beyond the surface of the movie they wouldn't have known that the USS Indianapolis was sunk by a Japanese sub and most of the men that made it into the water were eventually eaten by sharks that tattoo was a visible reminder of the pain that Quint tried to get rid of by having the tattoo removed, but it left the scars. He tried to remove that sign that brought him pain. But much like people in our lives, the people we hold near and dear to us who may cause us pain, sometimes they're removed from our lives. Sometimes they walk out of our lives. And even though that person or thing is no longer visible to us, the scars are still there. Those scars that people cannot see, like the one Captain Quint was carrying around. For every scar that shows on your body, there are scars that can never be seen by others. Only you know they're there. And not all of them come from some type of trauma. 
Now all the scars are from the hearts of a, well, because of a surgeon. But just like Hooper, some can come from relationships that have gone bad. I'm sure each of us have experienced a broken heart before. We all know something about being young and rejected by the person that we thought we were going to be with forever. It breaks your heart. But we survive. We're here. And we look at our scars and maybe we, can, we see the ugliness that's behind them when we look at them. The pain involved when we receive those scars. But I want you to challenge you to see the beauty that's in each and every one of those scars. Every scar is an example of God's grace. How the wounds that were meant to harm you have now been healed. The scars are part of your story. They are part of your witness. So in that moment in the room, Jesus was vulnerable and showed the disciples his scars. The places of pain from the betrayals. The places of suffering caused by his love for those uh, in his life. But most importantly, those scars were places of healing. It's evidence of healing. Those wounds are no longer open. They have been closed. They no longer cause the pain we once felt, but they are reminders of what God brought us through. Amen. And they're evidence of what others may need to get through their situations. So we must be present. We must be vulnerable. Next thing we need to be is real. Jesus did not only share the story of his scars. He said, touch and see. Now I can see the disciples just nervously reaching out and maybe barely touching him and pulling back real quick, right? Because if you think you saw a ghost, you wouldn't be like reaching out. You'd be like real timid reaching out to touch him. But that is not what Jesus is really inviting them to do here. The Greek word translated touch is selepheo. Selepheo. This means to handle something, to, to grab something. Jesus is saying to the disciples who were staring from shock, grab a hold of me. Grab, ground yourself in me. Grab a hold and see as if your life depended on it, as if your hopes would be found on it. Grab and hold on to the reality and see not just him, but yourself. See your path. See your future. See your mission and your reason for being. When you grab onto Jesus, it all becomes clear. But then Jesus does something rather odd. He asks for something to eat. It doesn't seem like it would be kind of a magic trick, but I'm like, why would he ask for something to eat? But Jesus is trying to drive this point home that he's real. Like many times before, he's being real by sharing a meal with the disciples. Sometimes when we're sharing with those who may not know us that well, they might be a little skeptical, right? What's the catch? What's in it for you? What do you want? You looking for money? I remember this time I was at Chipotle getting some lunch, and there was this gentleman outside uh, asking for money, and I don't normally carry cash on me, so I told him, you know, I don't have any cash on me, but I'll be happy to take you inside and, and get you something to eat, which I did. I, I let him get in front of me in the line. If you've ever been to Chipotle, you kind of go down and you tell him what you want on your, your burrito or in your bowl, whatever you're getting. And he gets to the line, and he, said, and he asked for guacamole. You ever been to, to Chipotle? The guacamole is extra. I was like, dude, really? <laughs> You're going to get guac too? But I didn't say anything. So he thanked me, and I went and sat down with my meal and started to eat lunch. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit really convicted me. I mean, how much more powerful would it have been if I had invited him to sit and eat with me as well? To hear his story, to share mine. See, it isn't enough to just give and go. That makes us feel good, right? Here, take some money, and we keep on going. But that's not what's going to get the prodigal to come home. We have to let them know that Jesus is real by being real with them. And then we need to be sharing. In the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, 
Jesus became present in the midst of their anguish over the day's events. They're lamenting to him about what had happened and to the great prophet Jesus of Nazareth. Then Jesus begins to share with them the message of Scripture. Starting from the beginning, through Moses, the prophets, he explained all that was to be written about him. And likewise, in our passage today, Jesus reminds everyone in the room what he had been teaching them the last three years. The Son of Man had to be handed over and crucified and would rise again on the third day. And again, he goes through Moses, the prophets, explaining everything that had to be fulfilled. See, our witness must include sharing the message of Scripture in its entirety. Another discussion we had in our study last week is one of the people said that that one time they thought the Old Testament and the New Testament were completely different books, which they are. But some some kind of think they're also different, not just different but completely separate, meaning one doesn't impact the other. But the word testament has a couple different meanings with one being something that serves as a sign or an evidence. And and the Old and New Testaments are both evidences of the events that took place from creation. But the biblical use of the word testament means a covenant. As in the Old Covenant, the law, and the New Covenant, grace. Now, many people see the New Testament as the Christian Bible because we're no longer under the Old Covenant, right? However, without the Old Testament, the teachings in the New Testament do not make any sense at all. We must share and teach the entirety of the Bible and the message of the gospel to make any sense. Without understanding what happened in Genesis, we would not understand when Paul states, we have all sinned. What are you talking about, Paul? Or when God becoming a man would not make sense without understanding the depravity of humanity. Why would he do that? Without the prophets and the Psalms, Jesus would not have had anything to reference to show that everything written was pointing to him. His incarnation, his ministry, his betrayal, his death, and most importantly, his resurrection. Without that, our faith is meaningless. That is what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. When he says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is worthless and so is your faith. It all hinges on the resurrection. Now our faith is not a blind faith that many people tell themselves who don't believe or don't want to believe. Our faith is grounded in the truths of Scripture, both Old and New Testaments. So our witness calls us to share the word that points to Jesus. And lastly, we must be obedient. Jesus makes it clear that we are and what we are commanded to do. In verse 48, Jesus proclaims, you are witnesses of these things. The Great Commission calls us for to go forth, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and catch this, teaching them, in other words, sharing, to obey everything that I have commanded you. In Acts 1.8, Jesus tells the disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my, what? My witnesses in Jerusalem, that's your family, that's your work, that's your friends. In Judea and Samaria, that's the people you like and the people you don't like. And to the ends of the earth, all races and ethnicities. See, Jesus is not giving us a suggestion. You may consider go. Jesus is not saying, if you have time, go. Jesus is not saying, if you feel comfortable doing it, go. No, Jesus says, therefore, go. In other words, because all you have heard, all you have seen, and all I have done for you, go. Go tell everyone you've seen. How do you think the church is doing with that? How do you think you are doing with that? In his book, Share Jesus Without Fear, William Fay recalls a dream that he had. 
In that dream, he says, a woman clutched a little girl, struggling to hold her child's head above water. Nearby, a wave plunged a man into the salty depths. He choked for air as he trashed, thrashed his arms against the ceiling of water. All around, the ocean churned with drowning people, gasping for air and desperately, desperately trying to push their heads above the surface. Their screams were doused by the roar of relentless waves. Their cries caught the wind, but only in vain. They were alone in their terror with no help in sight. Then a huge rock appeared, and a voice called into the darkness, and people began crawling up the rock sides to safety. But when they got to safety, something happened that drove me almost goofy, he said. The people who emerged from the waves got busy. They got involved with building rock gardens and rock lives and rock jobs and listening to their rock music and going to their rock meetings where they talked about all those people who were still out there drowning. But nobody went back to the water's edge to help. He says, have you ever tried to run or yell in a dream? In my dreams, I can do neither, he says, yet I tried to run. I tried to yell at the top of my lungs. How could you have forgotten the once you, once you were in the sea? As I watched the saved scurry about the rock work and I listened to their rock talk, I realized the rock was the cross of Calvary. The voice they had heard was Jesus calling by the power of the Holy Spirit, inviting them to come and join him. But he's never high on the rock where it's safe. He's calling from the ocean's edge where the dead, the deceased, and the lost are found. And as you might recall, that's where he found you. You hear all the time when someone's climbing that ladder of success or they actually made it to the top. What does the people tell them? Don't forget where you come from. As Christians, don't forget where you came from. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.